Okay, well, look, we'll get back into the kind of racing revision that we've been doing, and um, th th there's another type of reaction that we need to consider um, where there's an, uh, important interactions at the interface between our water and solids, and that's adsorption. Now, that this is a, a, I guess adsorption is a general term for a, quite a mishmash of reactions, but we'll give you the, um, the potted version right now. So the soil solids with um, functional groups, and by functional groups I mean these reactive atoms at the, the edges or ends of crystals, um, or even some of the uh, molecular fragments that we find left over on organic matter, can actually form very strong chemical bonds with uh, ions like, like metals or uh, phosphate or other oxyanions, uh, sulfate, chromate, things like that. Um, and they, these tend to be then rendered quite immobile or non-bioavailable. So the, the equilibrium is not a very rapid equilibrium in the same way that it is for cation exchange. So this is often called, in I guess old-fashioned or more simplistic terms, uh, fixation um, or immobilization of uh, elements in soils. So the type of reaction that we're considering is illustrated here for phosphate. So the phosphate is an oxyanion. Um, has, uh, in this case, phosphorus in an oxidation state of five, surrounding ox with oxygen atoms. Now, it just so happens that there are oxygen atoms in approximately, <coughs> not exactly, of course, approximately the same geometry on the surface, these exposed oxygen atoms on clays and oxides and things. So in the case of a, a, an oxyanion like phosphorus, which is able to uh, form very strong oxygen um, bonds to the central uh, phosphorus, uh, essentially a cation, but we don't usually consider it like that. <laughs> that whole thing can actually attach itself to the surface and form strong and stable enough bonds that it displaces some of the pre-existing oxygen atoms. So it almost becomes part of the structure. The oxygen atoms on the, the phosphate anion then become directly covalently bonded to the <coughs> central iron or, or silicon or aluminium atoms in the mineral structure itself. So it's an reaction that occurs right on the surface of minerals, uh, and it is mainly minerals in the case of uh, phosphate, um, and disturbs the, the actual structure of the surface. And in this case, it removes an, either a water molecule or hydroxide from the solution. That will depend on the pH of the system, because remember that the amount of hydrogen ion residing on that surface depends on pH, because these are weakly acidic and basic. But the normal consequence of that adsorption of phosphate is release of hydroxide. Now that means that the reaction will be strongly pH dependent. So anything that <coughs> tends to decrease the concentration of hydroxide effectively pulls that equilibrium across by what we have often learned as the Chatelier's principle um, and results in adsorption of more phosphate. Right? So and that would mean low pH, because low pH has low concentrations of hydroxide, right? It's kind of the definition of it. So phosphate and other oxyanions tend to be more adsorbed at low pH, and that's a general consequence. Um, that the reverse is almost true for cations. So this is one type of adsorption reaction. So again, the, the, while we call it, or we'll separate it out into a different type of reaction than the electrostatic or ion exchange reactions that we saw before is because of the strength of bonding. So it's, it's a chemical definition. Um, and we can also consider that to be formation of a complex at a solid surface, because here's the central metal ion in this case is inside the structure, and we've got a ligand, effectively phosphate, attaching itself to the metal ion. So it's, a, it's an analogous reaction to formation of a complex. Now, different types of adsorption. Now, wherever, wherever we've got oxygen-containing functional groups, one of the properties of, of oxygen um, in many uh, chemical uh, structures is that they have these things which are often given a couple of little dots in some chemical textbooks. It means an unbonding pair of electrons. Now, what that, and that, that would be the case for the type of uh, oxygen-containing functional group that we find on organic matter, but it's also the case for the um, exposed oxygen atoms at the surface of oxides and clays. Um, so we, we see a similar type of reaction in both cases, so I'm only going to show you the one with organic matter. 
where a metal ion, it can be anything, it doesn't even have to be divalent, this type of reaction we know occurs for trivalent metal ions like aluminium and iron and rare earth elements and so on, uh, may even occur for elements like gold, we're not really sure of that, so it's pretty universal, where the, the iron actually forms a bond with these spare electrons on the oxygen atom, and in this case it's hydrogen ions that are displaced. So again, a highly pH dependent reaction, but in this case, the reaction should proceed more to completion at high pH, right? Because uh, high pH is a, a solution with low concentrations of H+, so there's less, I guess, chemical potential, if you like, pushing the equilibrium back towards products. So the lower the pH, the lower the concentration of hydrogen ions, the more it'll pull the reaction, uh, sorry, the higher the pH, which means the more, uh, the less hydrogen ions we have in solution, um, the more the reaction will proceed to the right hand side, that is the adsorbed form, right? So we've got very strong uh, adsorption of cations at high pH. And this is one of, not the only, one of the main mechanisms for removing cations from the solution. So it's, it's a water composition controlling reaction in the same way that this anion adsorption is, right? Controls to some extent the concentration of phosphate in solution. Now, something that should be said about adsorption reactions is that always the, adsor the e position of equilibrium is heavily in favour of the adsorbed form. That's the most stable um, position of that equilibrium, if you like, or the state, stable state of the system for most ions. They tend to prefer to be adsorbed rather than be in solution if you want to anthropomorphise them a little bit. Right. So it's a very favourable and very stable reaction. Okay, so that adsorption, as we're showing here, can also occur on the surface of oxides. Again, non-bonding electron pairs on those oxygen atoms, that's just a kind of universal property of m oxygen atoms in most um, positions in structures like that, forms what we call a complex at the surface. Um, as we saw it before, it can occur with different types of oxygen containing fragments or functional groups on organic matter. Um, basically immobilizes, in this case, metals from the solution. So that, that's really important. What we observe, um, almost on a global basis, is that uh, there's a very strong correlation between iron concentration in soils and metals. And one of the theories for that, of course, is that metals become, by uh, a number of mechanisms, including this, uh, strongly associated with iron oxides because of their ability to undergo this type of reaction with a range of metal ions. So if you look at you know, continental scale databases of trace elements and major elements, there's <laughs> almost always a, a positive <coughs> linear correlation between copper and iron and zinc and iron and arsenic and iron because of this type of process, partly at least. All right, so, but we've got a couple of other things to consider. Um, we haven't at all considered the possibility that metal ions which are in solution and have their concentrations controlled by some sort of precipitation or dissolution processes, right? So, and this is quite often the case for iron minerals, the concentration of iron in solution reaches some maximum value because it can't get any higher because of the solubility of some insoluble mineral, and that could be something like gertite or ferrihydrate or hematite, an iron oxide mineral being the most common ones, or in reduced systems it will be a sulphide. Right, so the smelly black stuff that you find in beach sediments, iron sulphide, uh, is very insoluble. So it will reduce the concentration of iron in solution. Now, as we saw before, you, you, we've got a, a formal way of defining um, precipitation reactions. The threshold value is called KSP, or the solubility product, and that represents a, a theoretical maximum value for the what we call the iron product, the ION product, uh, for that particular solid. So remember that the uh, it's the product of product of product concentrations. We're getting a bit of terminology overlap here, um, but we need to raise things to the power of their uh, mole coefficient. So because three moles of hydroxide is produced here, we've got OH cubed um, defining KSP. So if that quantity is exceeded, then so that quantity being iron times hydroxide cubed then that solid should precipitate. That's the theory of precipitation or theory of, theory of equilibrium applied to precipitation dissolution. And so the, 
we can define a quantity that's the saturation index. We can measure iron concentration in solution, right? We take our water sample and we put it through an ICP or something and measure iron concentration. We can measure hydroxide iron concentration pretty easily too. We just measure pH and that defines our hydroxide concentration. And so we can calculate the ratio of, of that um, algebraic e expression to KSP. And if it's greater than one, then the system is oversaturated. In theory, the solid should precipitate. Um, and if it's less than one, nothing happens because it's undersaturated. That's the theory, anyway. Now, the, the output of programs like Freaksy will report it slightly differently. Um, they'll report a log saturation index. But that just means if, the, if you have a positive number, the system is oversaturated with respect to that solid. And so we can start to use that sort of information to say, well, maybe that solid is present in the system and it's controlling the concentration of iron or calcium or whatever we're interested in. Um, and if we have a negative number, it's un undersaturated. No solid, in theory, should be present. And I always use the disclaimer in theory because, as we noted before, things can be distant from equilibrium. All right, so let's, let's try and pull all that together in one place um, and then we'll move on and talk about something else. All right, so theory of, of um, I, I guess, uh, bioavailability or, or environmental mobility assumes that it's only the forms <coughs> of something that are in solution. Now, I'm, I'm focusing on a metal line here, just partly for a consistent story, partly that's what I know, so that's what I do, um, and you guys have to put up with it. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, but it, it applies to anything, right? So they're only the forms of metals or phosphorus or organic compounds that are actually in, dissolved in solution, not present as some form of solid, are the ones which are able to be taken up by the biology or can move around the system. They can leach into groundwater or, or be transferred from the soil into a stream or, or whatever, right? Um, now, but there are, of course, there are some controls on those and these concentrations are for most elements, apart from our conservatively behaving major elements like chloride and sodium and things, they're usually pretty low. And they're low because there are a whole lot of other reactions which can happen for our metal lines. As we just saw, they can form a whole bunch of different insoluble mineral phases. And that's really important for things like iron and aluminium and silicon and stuff. They, they form very sparingly soluble minerals like iron oxides and quartz and Gibbsite and things. Also, our, our element of interest may form as uh, in another solid, right? We've already seen a specific example of, of other elements getting into clays, for example, and we call that a co precipitate, if you like. So, and that's another reason we think iron oxides are so important, is because when they form, they're pulling in other elements. That there's enough similarity in the size of the ions that iron oxides can accumulate things like chromium and, and uh, rare earth elements. and uh, zinc and copper and things like that, all right? And, and of course, nothing's as simple as it seems. There's always some overlap. These are not you know, necessarily hard and fast categories. We'll always find something that um, is hard to classify. So I've drawn a little bit of overlap in our diagram there. And the controls on these sort of reactions are certainly pH. Um, so if we're precipitating hydroxides, then that precipitation reaction is more likely at high pH when the concentration of hydroxide is high and so on. Um, redox makes a difference. Whether we have sulfide present or not can make a huge difference in what types of solids precipitate. Um, and of course, the concentrations of the ions as we've just seen. All right, the other types of reactions that we just considered were a whole range of what I call surface reactions. And again, I've drawn overlapping um, parts to the diagram. And they're all, you know, in equilibrium with one another. Now this is a simplistic view, and you can imagine how tricky this might be, for instance, to model it mathematically. Um, it's possible, but there, there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, so we know that both the uncomplex metal ion and the complexes themselves, if they're, uh, particularly if they're cationic, can just interact electrostatically with clays and be held loosely like that. Um, we're not quite sure if those are actually bioavailable. Some data says, yes, simple complexes are bioavailable. Some data says, mm, for some elements, not. So that's why the dotted line is there. Um, but I didn't even talk about this middle ground of what I call outer sphere adsorption. I've, I've talked, and when I've described adsorption in terms of something we call inner sphere or 
adsorption or surface complexation where we have very strong adsorption. But there, of course, nature being what it is, there's always some middle ground and there's always some overlap too, the, you know, the things that are difficult to classify one way or the other. Um, <coughs> of course, um, that type of surface process can occur again for a complex. Um, so even anions can be exchangeable if, if positive charge exists in soils and as we've seen it's possible for it to under some conditions um, and they will be able to adsorb as well. So a lot of the stuff we find stuck to the surface of, of iron oxides or organic matter is not necessarily the uncomplex metal ion, it may be a metal hydroxide or metal chloride complex or something. So the whole thing gets, gets kind of messy conceptually. Um, fortunately, um, chemistry being what it is and the way that we can formalise chemical equations into mathematics, basically, chemistry becomes algebra, which is why a program like Freaksy works. So on, on Tuesday I'll unpack that a little bit more. Right? So, um, and of course those types of reactions, again, pH is a major control. So that's, that's why we always get you to measure soil pH, always, always, because it has this profound control on chemical reactions and biological processes, but as I already said, I don't know much about those. So. Um, adsorption is also dependent on ionic strength. Um, the reason why is partly because of the effect of electrostatics. So ionic strength is, is kind of a, um, exerts a control um, by some quite complicated theory actually, um, uh, which we won't go into, but it, it effectively um, high s neutral salt concentrations shield some of the electrical charge. Um, and they also, also uh, find that the high salt concentrations, the cation or anion in there, will be the dominant ion on the surface held by electrostatics anyway. Um, and uh, pH also affects the acid-base reactions on the surface itself, so the amount of hydrogen ion or, or not attached to the oxygen atom, so it affects that kind of competition at the surface for adsorption, um, both for anions and cations, we've already seen that. The type of surface makes a huge difference. So if we have mainly a, a quartz rich soil with not many reactive solids in it, we don't get much adsorption, right? Because it, quartz doesn't, it has large particle size, um, relatively unreactive surfaces. Whereas if we have lots of organic matter or lots of clay, then we have a much more reactive surface in terms of these sort of reactions. And of course the, the identity of the adsorbing ion, whether it's a cation or an anion, whether it tends to form strong or weak bonds and its concentration, Make, all make a difference to those sort of reactions. Okay. So if we're trying to build up a picture, there's a whole lot of things that we need to consider. All of these types of reactions and the concentrations of the things that we're interested in, both the concentrations of our potential um, ions of interest, the ones that might be essential or toxic to organisms, but also the, the stuff that they're going to react with in the soil or, or react to form in the soil. Okay, is that a good enough picture that we can go on with some other stuff? Yeah, good. All right, um, so I will leave that there for five seconds. So it's on the recording and then we'll move on. Okay, um, and if you want to follow up any of the basics of this, there's some reasonably good sources, most of them textbooks and some of them actually not available. Frank Lincoln retired from the university by 2005, so yeah, unlikely, they're probably collector's editions now. Um, there's plenty of good sources if, if you're uh, uncertain with some of this stuff and I've put some material on LMS, um, some journal articles or chapters, which particularly the chapter by um, Ken McQueen. Um, on regolith geochemistry. It's got a bit of a geology slash exploration bent to it, but it really has a good treatment of these types of reactions, so it's well worth having a look. Okay, go. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do is really, um, I, I think what we've just discussed leads quite well into a discussion of bioavailability, so we're going to have a, a quick look at that. Um, about 90 minutes to do the whole lot. We'll get there. Um, and then we're going to have a look at uh, analytical techniques. Uh, again, partly because um, it's useful to know about that, partly because I'm assessing you on it. Um, and it relates to our practical exercise. So let's let's get started on this. Um, I, I'll flick through some of this. Um, 
the, some good questions that we can ask ourselves about bioavailability. So um, first of all, what is it? Uh, so we'll, we better make some definitions of it in a minute. We've all probably got a vague idea about what it is. It's uh, whether a, a substance um, is available to a, an organism. Well, it's defined available. Um, more importantly, from chemistry um, point of view, uh, we're, we're interested in what we call the speciation or the forms of different elements. Um, so which forms of elements are bioavailable? Now that, surprisingly, that question hasn't necessarily been answered for everything. Uh, and there are still people working on that. So we, we've got some theories about that. Um, and it, it partly def depends on semantics, that is the definition that we use to, def um, t to put a handle on bioavailability, but also there, there's some real science in there that's unknown. And lastly, uh, and this is something we'll kind of segue into with the next uh, set of slides, is how can we actually measure this? Is it, is it too hard? Is it easy? Do we have to rely on complex techniques which actually measure the amount taken up by an organism before we can get a handle on bioavailability? Or are there some quicker and easier ways to do it? So we'll, we'll go through some of the concepts on that. So it, it's surprising. I, I reviewed, a little while ago now, I reviewed some of the literature about this and, and there were some pretty heavy duty authors out there um, who produced some very, very good reviews related to bioavailability in soils. Um, very, very few of them actually went as far as making a, um, a clear definition of what they meant by bioavailability at all. Um, so actually one of the best uh, places to find a good definition is a, a kind of a mini review by Kirk Semple, who actually works on mainly on organic contaminants, um, but the principles are the same. So uh, Semple and co-workers define bioavailability if direct transfer of that material can occur from the soil into an organism. So there's nothing, no steps that have to occur in between. But they also uh, distinguished a, a fraction of elements in soils, and I'll show you a diagram of this in a minute so it's a bit clearer, um, that they call bioaccessible. So that they're not immediately available to interact with organisms, but they, there are some steps in between that will render them bioavailable. They can resupply that bioavailable pool. But there's something that takes time uh, or something that uh, needs to cross a space to get them into a bioavailable form. So their, their diagram looked something like this. So first of all, they've got some organisms in there, some little microby critters, an earthworm and a plant root representing the biology in the system. So anything that they is in direct contact or in the solution, the same solution, if you like, that the organism is in, the plant root or the bacteria or the earthworm, then that's bioavailable. Right? There's no reaction or uh, mass transfer that has to occur before it can interact with the, the organism. Okay. Now, there are um, different constraints which render something bioaccessible but not bioavailable. And that can be these surface um, processes, so adsorption, or and, and usually it's the, the weaker adsorption mechanisms like cation exchange that we consider uh, are bioaccessible. So as I mentioned, if we deplete this bioavailable amount in the solution, the stuff which is weakly attracted to the soil solids can re-establish equilibrium with the solution. So a bit more becomes bioavailable. Obviously that can't happen infinitely, but it, it's an important process. Um, and the other main way in which something can be bioaccessible is if it's in uh, a space that or an organism can't interact with, but it can relatively easily diffuse out into the solution again. So again, there's some resupply over a realistic time scale that can occur. Now, non-bioaccessible is where either that physical process, the diffusion out of a small space can't occur, or, or um, whether something is actually intrinsic to the structure of a mineral or it's very, very strongly absorbed, so it's never going to be released or the equilibrium is too slow. All right. So though that's how we make those distinctions. Now, if, if you think about that, then the, some of these forms, they, they relate to 
chemical reactions or chemical forms of elements. Some of them do, some of them don't. So that the f we're going to, for the moment at least, ignore the physical constraints. So we'll, we'll pretend that tiny pores that bacteria or plant roots get into don't exist, or they do and we don't need to consider them, or something like that. We'll just think about the chemical forms um, and how they might relate to bioavailability. Bio now that this necessarily is going also to relate to how we measure these things. It's all very well knowing or suspecting that iron exchangeable elements exist in the soil, but how do we know unless we can measure it? So um, some of what I talk about today will be related to that. Okay, so um, how do we relate the biological concept of availability or bioavailability to chemical concepts of speciation. Speciation meaning the existence of an element in different forms. All right. So what has been done in the past, and this is and it's still done quite a lot, is that we can instead of, for example, aluminium is a good example, because aluminium is everywhere in soil. So it's it's one of the top five elements in the crust. But it's actually present at very, very low concentrations in, in natural waters, including in soils. Um, and it's also a good example because if the concentrations of aluminium get too high, as most of you will know, it's toxic to plants. It stunts root growth and can ultimately result in death of plants. Aluminium toxicity is, is probably the issue in, in acidic soils of many types. Um, but, um, okay, so how do we, how do, we do that? The, the most common way to do that something like we've described below, you take some soil, instead of measuring total aluminium, which would give you like 3%, it wouldn't mean anything in terms of biology, you shake it up with some solution, right? Add a solution to the soil, which might be a, a dilute electrolyte, something like calcium chloride or potassium chloride, uh, or a very dilute acid or something like that, and that extracts just a tiny fraction, which is assumed to relate to a particular chemical form. So we shake, um, something up with an electrolyte. Now in, in theory that only takes out the forms, the, the aluminium which is held electrostatically. So it's on the surface of clays and is in rapid equilibrium, right? And there's been some success in doing that and relating what you can measure in that way because you get a solution. You can take that away and measure aluminium in it. It doesn't represent all the aluminium in the soil uh, but it represents this bioavailable fraction, right? If, if that makes any sense. And we'd, we'll unpack that idea. And that, that's historically been the practical way to try and assess bioavailability. And many, many soil tests are based on this idea. Okay, so for example, we measure phosphorus in soils. We don't measure total phosphorus in soils. We use um, coal well phosphorus. We shake it up with a weak solution of bicarbonate. It extracts weakly absorbed phosphate, and that's a measure of phosphorus fertility of soils. It's not a total extraction. So we've got some uh, conceptual idea of what it's doing uh, but is that real life? So let, let's go through and... Oh, okay, we've lost... That looks pretty crappy, actually, doesn't it? I'm not quite sure what did. <coughs> I think there's some, some uh, equal signs and, and minus signs. It's supposed to be a, a uh, multiple regression equation. I will try and explain it as I go on. <coughs> All right, so uh, what McBride uh, and co... So Murray McBride is kind of a... A hotshot soil chemist, one of, one of the, uh, I guess, influences of soil science over the years. He was at Cornell University, retired now, uh, wrote a textbook, all that sort of thing. So a famous dude. Anyway, they did, he and some co-workers did some research a while ago that, that said if you, if you analyse metals in soils, you can predict the concentration in solution, which was this quantity here, which special symbols have gone to pot, um, from a, a multiple regression equation, and uh, let's not, we, I can't remember the signs, but it's related to pH, which makes sense. It's related to the total amount of metal in the soil, which also makes sense. And in their case, um, to uh, the organic matter concentration. So they're, they're analysing topsoils, of course. So, and that suggests that what was controlling metal concentrations in the solution, or, or what might potentially be bioavailable, was some sort of adsorption process. So it seemed to relate to a, a particular type of chemical reaction that we already knew about as well. So this type of research made a lot of sense and there was a bit more work done on it which kind of expanded on it. So th there's a specific example for, for copper here. 
showing that you know, copper's uh, uh, yeah, without the signs. Um, but the, the prediction ability was quite good. We've got an R squared, that is a squared there, a value of 0 0.89, which means that quite a bit of the variability in, in um, measured copper in solution um, and predicted was explained by that model. Oh, here, here's the model here. Right? Okay, apart from a couple of, of oddball points. So there was quite good prediction. So with th this was a promising approach, although it, it meant multiple measurements, so it wasn't that convenient. So where do we go with the theory next? Um, so let, let's talk about what the theory is. So we, we mentioned this already, that the free iron uh, activity model ex assumes that the only thing that's in that immediately accessible um, fraction of an element or molecule that's available to our bacteria or soils, uh, soil roots or, or soil organisms or whatever, um, it's just the free, uncomplex metal ion in solution, right? So, uh, and that made sense, I guess, from a plant nutrition point of view uh, and matched some experimental data. Uh, and there's a whole lot of these, so you can show that it matches experimental data, both for plant uptake and uptake of, of um, in this case, metal elements by uh, some soil organisms as well. And I think uh, Van Kestel and Kohlhaas um, looked at calembola, for example. So they had calembola in, in soils of different cadmium concentrations and they measured how much cadmium ended up in the little critters. Don't ask me how they did the analysis. Ethics approval was probably required. Right. Um, now, the, the free iron activity model, though, it doesn't account for everything, right? Because if we only consider that, that tiny amount, which is dissolved in the soil solution, is not in a complex or anything, it certainly doesn't account that uh, something that we know is probably true, that some of our soil solid phases, our exchangeable cations and so forth, can resupply that solution. So it's a little bit simplistic. And it, there's another thing that it doesn't consider, is that the organism itself has an interface, right? It's got a cell wall, and that interface behaves a little bit like an adsorbing surface. So there's competitive interactions that can go on there. So it didn't consider that. So we wouldn't necessarily expect it to apply in soils. The free iron activity model was really um, developed uh, in solution culture and things like that. We're growing plants in the absence of soils and just in a solution where it works very, very well. Um, but here's, here's some tests of the free iron activity model. Um, and uh, <coughs> on our vertical axis, we've got uh, basically the concentration, in this case, of cadmium measured in the bodies of uh, calembolins, so little springtails, um, and different measures of cadmium in solution or predicted values. And so wh what we can see, if we look at the, the top left-hand curve here, is this is uh, log cadmium concentration in the solution. Uh, and this is log uptake by the organism. And this seems to be a pretty good relationship, and it kind of makes sense. It reaches a threshold value and the organism can't take up any more, probably because it dies. Um, and so you, you can modify that some ways, uh, and the, the best prediction was that when you slightly modified the cadmium concentration uh, using pH, because pH um, not only affects the speciation of cadmium also affects this competition at the organism solution interface, so the, the, the actual mechanism for uptake of cadmium into the calembola in this case, uh, we get a, a pretty good prediction, right? So we'll go on to that. Um, but that there was some work done uh, at the turn of the century roundabout by a team at Lancaster University, um, Ha Zhang and, and Bill Davison, who invented this little device very, very nifty, nifty enough to get published in Nature, which was called a, a diffusive gradient in thin films device, or DGT for short. And what DGT did is kind of sits in the soil um, and acts like a plant root. It takes up stuff by diffusion and it has a little collector in, inside, so it always maintaining that concentration gradient. Um, and so it takes up all the stuff in solution and allows the soil solids to then replenish what it's taking up. And they showed that this uh, DGT device, the concentration that you can measure with that, was by far the best predictor of copper uptake by plants. Um, and it was actually better than copper iron activity. And so that was pretty good um, evidence that uh, the free iron activity model for soils wasn't quite up to it, it because it didn't account for this resupply. Uh, 
uh, and it agreed with some other work, and there's some details of it there. I won't go through that because we're in a bit of a hurry, but here, here are the, the stats on it. So this is this CE is what we call equivalent concentration. So it's what the little DGT devices measure, and they're just like a little a, a disc with a, a diffusion membrane on the front and a collector behind that. Um, the diffusion geometry is very well constrained, so we can back calculate to concentration, and it correlated in this case very well on a log-log scale with copper uptake by plants across at least two orders of magnitude. So it was a pretty impressive result. Um, and here's the, the old free iron activity model measuring the actual activity of copper in the solution and matching that against the same plant uptake data didn't give nearly as good prediction, although you know it gave a, a positive relationship, which was kind of gratifying for the, those researchers. Right? So th this is quite an important result because it tells us something about the dynamics of soils, that we can't just consider the instantaneously bioavailable stuff as being important to biota. We need to consider the ability of the soil to resupply as well. Um, but there, there may be some simpler ways to do that, of course, and we'll, we'll come to that in the next section. Um, so because of this, um, the, well, and, or not really in response to it, there, there's another approach that you can use. So there, there were some early workers, again, around um, 15 years or so ago now, who showed that for, they, they were interested in toxicity of elements actually to fish in streams in the US. And what they showed, with, they got some pretty odd results. They got some odd results that suggested that in some cases, the metal ions were less toxic under acidic conditions, which just totally goes against what you'd normally think. And the reason why is because um, the, the uptake of these metals was mainly in the gills of the fish. Like so they, you know, there's a lot of water running over the gills, and then the gills have receptors on them which can absorb hydrogen ions and the toxic metals of whatever type. So the hydrogen ions are actually blocking at low pH because they're binding more at low pH, there's more of them around, they're blocking the metal uptake. And so they, they developed this model called the biotic ligand model which explicitly considered that sort of process. Um, now it was easy for them because they were working in a completely aquatic environment. They didn't have to muck around with the adsorption and precipitation reactions that we have to fiddle with in soils. So it, it, but what it did is it successfully predicted, first of all, bioaccumulation. I think they used trout hatchlings in the first experiments and then extended that work to show that it, it actually was pretty good for just about every aquatic organism. And it's become, I, I guess, the, the gold standard model for bioavailability of at least metals in completely aquatic systems. So um, people thought about using it for soils. So, you know, and th this is the way that the discipline has gone. As I said, aquatic chemistry is, has informed soil chemistry to quite a large extent. Um, but that uh, Wang et al. suggested that because there's so many other things going on in soils, um, then the, the soil effects, so the effects of pH on soil reactions would dominate instead of the effects of pH on the, the plant root surface or your microbial surface or whatever. Um, but, um, it was shown that under some conditions, um, and this is a work by the Kali at also did a multi um, organization there were US people, people from the, the top organizations in the UK um, worked on this as well. And here, here's their model that they've got this biotic ligand where competition for uptake of a toxic iron with calcium and hydrogen ions can occur, but they're also considering the soil interactions as well. So the the aquatic people only had to consider the, the right-hand side of the diagram. The soil people had to include a bit more stuff in their model. However, let's, let's see what they got. So what they did was that they, they grew a crop plant, I think it was barley, um, and they used as their experimental endpoint the, the root growth of the barley under conditions of a contaminated soil. So that, and they used nickel for, I don't, I don't know why they chose, chose nickel. Um, and they, they showed that a biotic ligand model worked. So it added just that extra layer of complexity. This um, soil side of the equation here was include, uh, sorry, the, the organism side. So other conceptual models of how soil works and how bioavailability works up to then had only considered really the left-hand side of the diagram, 
the aquatic people, of course, had only considered this part, and these people were the first to combine the whole lot. All right? Um, so um, let's have a look at their data. So this, this is the type of thing they got. Um, now that there's three different ways of predicting. In this case, this is BRE is barley root elongation. So that's their measure of biological effect or their endpoint, if you like. And there's some different ways of measuring, in this case, the nickel concentration in soil. You can measure total nickel, but look, there's not a lot going on. Although there's a, you know, kind of an on-off effect here. <laughs> Low nickel, no, whoops no toxic effect, high nickel, toxic effect, that's about as far as they go because it's scatter in the data. Now if, if you sharpen that up a little bit and actually try and estimate nickel concentration in the solution, so this is back to our free iron uh, activity model, the prediction becomes a lot better but it came the very best of all when they measured this quantity um, in the italic F here which was the fraction of the barley root surface occupied by nickel. So they can estimate that from their model and that seemed to be the best predictor of toxicity. We've no longer got that extreme scatter that we <coughs> see with total nickel, which tells us nothing about toxicity, um, but uh, we've got a, a reasonably good predictive effect. It's no longer on off. We've got a, you know, a reasonable um, predictive <coughs> ability for the, the intermediate toxicities as well. Probably a little bit better than nickel in solution did. So that was quite a good result, although, um, and here's some of the data on uh, just looking at predicted versus observed, different ways of looking at the same data. I won't go into that too much, um, except to make a comment on it, um, that it worked because of the very, very high concentrations of nickel that they were using. And, and so some of the soil effects in that case were swapped out. If the concentrations of nickel were low, then kind of nickel to reactive solid ratios would be pretty low and, and those soil effects, the effects of pH on adsorption and precipitation would be expected to predominate. And it was only in a contaminated soil that they got it to work. So some of the questions about this, well, uh, and I actually talked to one of the authors a few years ago, and they've, they've kind of moved away from this technique, partly because it's, uh, it, although it's a very, very satisfying conceptual model and probably is the most realistic way of looking at things, it's too hard to implement, right? So how do you do it? How do you measure bioavailability um, properly, if you like? Well, here's, here's an, another study. Um, let's look at some of the summaries of this. So this is really a meta-analysis, so a, a study of other studies, kind of like a literature review, but they're actually doing some extra data analysis themselves. Um, where they looked at toxicological studies from soils um, mostly in Europe and looked at the, the measures of bioavailability and how they related to particular biological endpoints and that usually that was some, uh, it was called um, EC50 values or the effective concentration at which 50% survival occurred, right? And so what, what they s noted is that there was a, quite a range of threat or critical values for this EC50 uh, and the range was offset depending on what type of technique that you use. So obviously for um, total soil copper, um, there was a different range, uh, different variance, if you like, 70% variation coefficient or relative standard deviation in the data. Um, and the, the measure with the lowest variability in it was this uh, total copper just as a percent of the effective cation exchange capacity. Right, so again, coming back to cation exchange has been a really important determinant of this bioaccessible pool of elements, um, but based on stuff that's relatively easy to measure. You know, uh, total elements and soils, pretty easy to measure. Um, the very lowest variability came from DGT, but DGT, again, it's hard to do. It's a, a technically demanding um, procedure um, and it's also more expensive as well and uh, only a few labs around the place are actually set up to do it. Um, so they've, they've gone away from it and plus it's been shown that it, while it works quite well for copper, it doesn't work so well for other elements either. All right. So this, this um, quantity, total copper as a percent of effective cation exchange capacity seemed to be the one to use. Now let, let's um, again further unpack that a little bit because the, 
isn't the end of the story. There are a couple of other things which are going to affect bioavailability in soils. Um, one, of course, will be pH, although that didn't turn out to be a, a major predictor in many of the cases. But the other, one main thing that we need to consider is actually how long the soil has been contaminated for. And that relates to, obviously, time-dependent phenomena, um, the kinetics of the changes in forms of elements. So when you add a, a metal to a, so a soil, it's actually quite bioavailable, bioavailable at the beginning. But then when it starts to react, and, and first of all, it'll react with the stuff it can react with fastest, which may not be the most stable or immobile forms. And ultimately, as that system ages, it matures, it goes through a form of what a geologist would call diagenesis to ultimately get to the most stable configuration. And so bioavailability tends to ramp down the longer we leave it. All right? It's called an, an ageing effect um, in simple terms. So that had to be added into the model. So you notice that measuring copper in the soil solution, that's our free iron activity model, doesn't explain uh, toxicity with low variability. Um, DGT is good, but it's too complex, and so we use that. But how, how were these data used? Well, th th this is something that was, I, I guess, suggested for um, regulatory inclusion in the European Union. I'm not sure if it actually made it in, but um, looking at what you would need to consider uh, in the models. And with all the elements considered, cobalt, nickel, copper and zinc, this effect of cation exchange capacity was um, a, a common normalising factor, or in other words, a common predictor of um, metal toxicity. But they, there were also these different leaching ageing factors representing the, the effect of how long that contamination had been in the soil. There was kind of a fudge factor that they added as well, and they also needed to consider soil conditions. Um, so is it a highly sensitive soil? Now this, this relates, this, this is for me a little bit fudgy as well, because it relates to the sensitivity of the microbial population. But in, in a, if you think about it, that makes sense, because the microbial population that has been exposed to metal con contamination, for example, for a long time, will select the selection pressure on that, at least, or the, the metals, which, uh, the organisms which are more tolerant to those sort of conditions will start to dominate and they'll create a weakly sensitive soil. So that, that kind of makes sense and it relates to our leaching aging factor as well. So there was kind of a protocol that they went through. Um, uh, they selected a, a preliminary, uh, either a no effect concentration or uh, effective concentration for 10% survival, blah, blah, left and um, subtracted background values, um, corrected for the time the contamination had been in the soil, um, and then using these species-specific bioavailability slopes, they calculate this um, overall hazardous concentration. But the, the important point from my point of view as a soil chemist is that it relies uh, to a, quite a large extent on two pieces of soil chemical data. One more obviously soil chemical than others, but the, the total concentration and the effect of cation exchange capacity seem to be really important, and there's also this leaching aging factor, which I would argue relates partly to a, a chemical process as well. So that, that's kind of the story as to whether the science has got in terms of bioavailability, all right? So um, we'll leave it there. We'll take another break for probably five or 10 minutes and get back into the, some other stuff quickly talk about analysis. I do want to also quickly talk about um, redox and we'll have a bit of content thrown at you in, in the lab tomorrow as well.